If you're watching NewsX, I'm Rishabh Gulati. Ladies and gentlemen, credibility. To be convincingly believable. Now, I want you to understand basic facts. There is an awe about what America is, has been for decades. And it is a deserving awe. I mean, look at it. During the Second World War, after FDR repeatedly came and said, no, we will not fight, we will not fight, it is not our, 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 not our war. Then, of course, the day that lived in infamy on December 7, 1941, and it is now America's war. Look at what they did after that. The Liberty ships, 10,000 ton ships, they were building one per day. One naval vessel, a cargo vessel was being built per day. The Americans built 100,000 tanks in about three or four years. They supplied themselves with 29 aircraft carriers and gave 14, 15 aircraft carriers to the British Royal Navy. The scale at which they went to operation, the organizational ability. Think of the Manhattan Project. In 1941, nobody's even heard of uranium and radioactive and the ability to convert that into energy. Within four years, 600,000 people worked together to produce a workable bomb, which was then used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Rightly or wrongly, you can have that argument. But the credibility to deliver when, when uh, JFK came and said, we will put a man on the moon before the decade is out, you won't believe it. Again, three, four hundred thousand people worked on a single project and they did it within eight years. From scratch. From being far behind to having a, a crew on, on, on the surface of, of the moon. High levels of credibility. The same high levels of credibility happened when in 62, Adlai Stevenson went before the Union Security Council and said, here, here, here's the satellite photograph of the nuclear weapon missiles that the USSR is putting into Cuba and that is intolerable to us. So credibility matters. It matters heck of a lot. It should matter. So where does it go? Circle back from October 1962 to February 2003, when a Colin Powell sits down before the UN Security Council and he tells them, look, Iraq is full of weapons of mass destruction. They're everywhere. Only he doesn't show photos. He shows diagrams and some maps. But of course we believe him. It's Colin Powell, for God's sake. US Secretary of Defense, he's come, made a presentation. This is the new Adlai Stevenson moment. And then nothing. I don't know whether to appreciate the honesty of the American forces that did go in, that they didn't find a single barrel of anything. Nothing. So credibility matters. So we are having here a conversation on credibility predicated by these rather obnoxious innuendos that are being made. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States of America the North American ally of the Canadians, conducted near 400 drone strikes and countless cruise missile strikes into Pakistani territory, killing more than 4,500 people, including two to 300 children. Maybe a couple of those thousands were civilians. Uh, a few were, of course, terrorists who were operating. They willfully violated Pakistani airspace whenever they effing wanted. When they sent in a Navy... SEAL team on their choppers, violating Pakistani airspace, violating Pakistani soil. Why? Because they couldn't trust the Pakistanis who were hiding Osama bin Laden next to a military containment. And a president, President Barack Obama, came out and he held it on his chest. Wow, what an operation, what an amazing job. Good job, guys. We will eliminate Osama bin Laden. It was in Pakistani territory. Okay. Currently, the U.S. former president is being indicted on criminal charges. He's also the principal opposition leader. I don't know. We're not saying anything. Is there an official Indian government position decrying democracy in the U.S. over this? So it's a matter of credibility. So when the Canadians now come and say that the Indians are interfering in Canadian elections, believe it or not, we've heard it before. 
if you believe some Canadians, so-called uh, former intelligence officers, in 2009 they've been writing books. One of the books claims that India, as a government, interfered in the Kanishka bombing investigation in order to bury the investigation. We ourselves killed the investigation by interfering. I mean, it's, it's next levels of epicness that sometimes take place. Now, the same people, okay, the CSIS, which is the Central Intelligence Agency, okay, could not convict the people who conducted the worst terror attack in the history of the planet before 9-11. So much so, ladies and gentlemen, that when the principal accused went to a forest, and we've covered this a few months ago, from the Canadian report, commission report into this, and conducted a test run of an explosion while being physically followed by Canadian intelligence operations, operatives, they still couldn't figure it out. All this information is flashing now on your screens. Now, this is the credibility, modern day credibility of what is left. So, this Five Eyes Intelligence, which is the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK, New Zealand already says we don't know. The American ambassador is sitting with us and talking about the thin red line. I don't know what thin red line they were discussing when they were going into Abbottabad. I don't know what thin red line uh, they were, must be discussing uh, when they review the CIA files into the death of Homi Baba in the plane crash in Mont Blanc. I don't know what thin red line. So it's, it's, a, it's a credibility issue and I can't believe that the Americans are able to look you in the eye or the Canadians are able to look you in the eye and still be taken seriously. It's a credibility issue. Let's have this conversation. General Gigi Duvedi joining us on the broadcast. Madhav Nalapath is with us. Uh, Ambassador Baswati Mukherjee uh, joining us on the broadcast uh, as well. Colonel Sodhi is with us and Robindas is there. Professor Nalapath, let me quickly begin with you, sir. You've seen a flurry. Okay, you've seen Eric Garcetti last week. The Canadians are doubling in, doubling up, that not only are we interfering in investigations, carrying out extrajudicial killings, heck, we are now interfering in Canadian elections. Uh, Rishab, I want to point out that the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, is facing credible allegations, frankly, highly well-sourced allegations that there is too much of PRC influence in the Canadian government. And PRC influence means there's also Pakistan influence. And you remember the Sino-Pakistan lobby. And he wants to divert attention from the overwhelming Chinese influence in Canada by tossing a fake story. And that fake story is Indian interference in Canadian elections. That's absolute rubbish. And he knows it. The, uh, certainly we are interested in what's happening in Canada. Why? Because a lot of people in Canada are actively funding, equipping, training, and otherwise boosting the capabilities of terrorist groups who are wanting to create mayhem, who have created mayhem, who have cost uh, you know, dozens of lives. As you correctly said, the Kanishka bombing cost hundreds of lives. And this is what's happening in Canada. Do you mean to say that India should not, uh, what they want basically is, India should not investigate the very close links between these terror groups and individuals highly placed in the Canadian government. Individuals whom Justin Trudeau is protecting rather than prosecuting. Mm -hmm. This is the point. As far as the United States is concerned, well, there's a Sino-Wahhabi lobby. Look at today's front page in the Sunday Guardian. It's all about this very powerful lobby, very well-funded lobby. And we all know that there are, I mean, I, I'm not going to name individuals, but several individuals have been identified as being in the pockets of the Chinese Communist Party. The Communist Party of China wants nothing more than to see India and the United States fight each other. And to and the worst nightmare is India and the U.S. coming together in a security partnership. A absolutely and right. I can't and, understand and, and, and Eric Garcetti. And, old, and, and Justin Trudeau doesn't seem to understand that, okay? And if he doesn't understand it, somehow there's interference in, uh, in elections. Uh, General Duvedi, in a very practical way, what an honest conversation would look like that, listen, we are the North Americans. We have interfered in every single country across the globe, from the Bay of Pigs 
onwards. Okay. Uh, we conduct assassinations all the time. We do regime change all the time. We lecture everybody all the time on everything. Okay. We understand that, but now we respect you. So you have certain problems with elements seeking the destruction of India who are residing in Canada and the US. We are going to arrest them and we'll hand them over to you. There is obviously no question of anybody having to worry about awkward conversation on a third red line because now we are friends. But no, they will aid, abet, support, fund people who want the breakup of India, then say we are friends with India and then lecture us on the thin red line. I mean, how is this making sense? It just doesn't make any sense. Well, Nishib, I think you raised the point of credibility. Well, credibility cannot be selective. That's the tragedy of these nations. They make credibility suit their own interest. And similarly, in the same breath, I would like to reiterate that the color of the lines does not change. The red lines do not change to yellow or green lines when your own interest is involved. And that's again is the second tragedy with America and its allies, that they tend to be very selective on credibility and tend to be very selective on the red line, yellow and green lines. Having said that, we need to understand the internal dynamics of Canada. Today, Trudeau's government is in power, kind courtesy, people like Jagmeet and the National Democratic Front Party, who totally support the terrorist organization and also the forces which are inimical to the interests of India. And this I can vouch with certain amount of credibility that I belong to Jalandhar, we have a family farm close by, and I have been following the former vegetation, how it has been financed, how it has been influenced, the forces behind it are largely the needle points to Canada and its uh, counterpart in America. Now, Rishab, we need to understand two very important things. In international politics, it's the national interest. And for national interest, these countries can compromise on the bilateral relations as they suit them, the point number one. And secondly, the nations have to be strong to respond. And India's political leadership, our diplomatic leadership and military leadership, we need to respond and tell them very clearly that when national interest, national security is involved, there will be no compromise. There can be no... No, no sir, but, but it is the... Again, we are saying it clearly. What I am not still understanding is that these are not people who don't understand the almost incredible, incredible insanity of the argument that you're looking straight in the eye and saying, no, no, after having killed citizens of their countries all over the globe, okay, in indiscriminate invasions and firings and assassinations that they happen till today, I mean, ask, ask the Iranians, okay. You might not like the Iranians, but Iran would consider itself a sovereign country, okay. Uh, so, killing their citizens in a US strike uh, would be considered crossing a thin red line, wouldn't it be? But no. So, Ambassador Mukherjee, what, what is, with, with what mindset does an Eric Garcetti, for example, come to India? With what mindset is now a Trudeau operating? What is the logic behind what they're operating now? The mindset, Harishab, is very clear. The thin red line are for those who are unequal partners in a strategic partnership. The thin red line applies to, the, to those who consider themselves to be equal, but who they do not consider to be equal. Therefore, Garcetti, as U.S. ambassador, during in the middle of India's election campaign, can talk of India crossing thin red lines, thereby actually encouraging a partisan dialogue because some of what he said has been said by some in India's opposition who clearly are mouthing a narrative coming from outside. That's the first point. The second point is that credibility has to come from those whose actions are credible. Those who participated in a cold war, bringing down other, their enemies, so-called enemies as, uh, in other territories, those who participated in the assassination of Homi Baba, those who possibly participated in the poisoning of Lal Bahadur Shastriji, those who are experts at talking about WMPs in Iraq and bringing down Saddam Hussein 
when it is credibly established that there are no WMDs and that the whole thing was a hoax, then reminds us of a farce. And, and the, the, in the farce, the question arises, what role do we have? The role that we have is that of a credible country, colonized, now a proud country, emerging as a great power, being told how to mind our manners because we are not yet fit to sit at that big table where the big powers are. The answer to that, Bishop, is to tell them clearly that the thin red line has been crossed by the American ambassador when he talked in the manner that he did, and we've already discussed it two days ago in this very channel. Yes. The thin red line has been crossed again and again by countries who believe in extrajudicial killing. No thin red line has been crossed by us. The thin red line again has been crossed because they repeatedly re refused to hand over Indian nationals plotting India's downfall, okay. sitting in their capitals, and then they talk okay, about... Okay, so, exact, so that's exactly the point. Ladies and gentlemen, okay, let us assume that uh, for a moment of argument, it's not happened, unlikely to happen, but for a moment of argument, let's say that there are three or four members of the provisional IRA. They've just blown up a small boat in which uh, Louis Mountbatten happened to be sitting, and they've assassinated him, right? And uh, we give them political asylum in India. You would think that's a bit odd. Now, I want you to ask, think about the Swiss authorities, other European nations, the Canadians. You won't believe it that it's a dhanda by visa advisors in India that say, if you want to get citizenship of Canada, make up a story that you are a some sort of political refugee and you're, you'll get your permanent residence PR much faster. Okay, it's dhanda go, going up operating. I'm seeing it anecdotally, of course, but a dhanda is operating. Something do dodgy is going on. Colonel Sodi, like I said, in an ideal scenario, all right, uh, Air India would send a telex to the Canadian, Royal Canadian Mounted Police telling them that we have credible information from Indian intelligence that one of our aircraft is about to be the subject of the bombing next month. Literally, they're given the date that this is going to happen. And it would be reasonable that Canadian intelligence would, would run and jump and do everything possible later on to discover that they're actually tracking the individuals who are going to conduct the bombing, who are conducting test bombings while they're physically under recce. And they would catch these people or at worst, if something happens, arrest these people, convict them, and we would all be together logically. But there's a logic defeat here. Why is that happening? Why can't these people actually work with us? Because I'm not here sitting here advocating, maybe I should, that we should give political asylum to all the members of the IRA and, and I don't know, many others. Jahan Rishabh, it's my honor to be on a news channel and a privilege to be with the esteemed co-panelist. There's a famous book which I would request your uh, viewers to read whenever they get time. The name of the book is Cold Terror. How Canada Nurtures and Exports Terrorism, written by Stuart Bell. The book very clearly and nicely brings out facts and figures to prove that since 1980, Canada is the new epicenter of terrorism ever since Pere Trudeau. The father of the present Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, became Canada's uh, Prime Minister for a second term. Since 1980, Canada has not only given asylum to the Khalistanis who ran from India, but also to jihadis from all over the world. It is very hilarious and humorous that a developed country like Canada is leveling false allegations on a developing country like India about interference in their internal elections. India neither has the capacity nor the capability being a developing country to interfere in others' elections, and neither we have an intent or a policy in doing so. It is in fact Canada who for many decades now has been allowing its soil to be used for anti-India activities. It is Canada who should be taken to the International Court of Justice for allowing its soil to be used for to people for waging a war against India. I totally agree with you, Rishabh. I have been following your channel regularly. Few months back, Kanishka Files, which was a fantastic program brought out by Team NewsX, which clearly brought out how evidence it was there in the public domain, which uh, indicted the Canadians of, you know, not acting when intelligence was given to them. If a 
a national international news channel can dig out such you know uh, evidences i am sure there would be so no, much but it wasn't difficult sir it's it's been published by justice john major who's a canadian retired jurist who investigated the kanishka bombing and he said i can't understand and i i, I can quote copiously from his ruling as i've already done can't understand uh, how how these things were missed it's it's bizarre justin trudeau as we speak seems to be convinced that he has to stand against the tide of history and destroy associations between america and india now that he that his father's foundation received 200000 dollars from the chinese uh, for conducting conferences that were never held uh, might just be coincidence it's perfectly okay to receive funding for conferences that that's perfectly routine professor nalapat so is is that's what's happening now this is all all bunkum uh, and the only thing is being done is so that we get het up and the americans get het up and then you know we we get mean with each other well quite frankly rishab if the us ambassador acts in a manner which plays directly into the interest of china then i think uh, he needs to be uh, co- corrected by someone in the biden administration instead of which if people in the biden administration are encouraging him to do so then the question is why are they working to destroy and demolish the india us relationship this is the world's largest democracy in terms of population india and the us have have uh, be- become very close security partners why are they working to destroy that i mean i can understand the chinese ambassador or uh, uh, trying to destroy uh, india us relations but when the american ambassador becomes you know active in doing things which uh, which really put a sledgehammer to india us relations is time to ask some pointed questions and i'd like to point out so so far as uh, canada is concerned the reality is that i quite agree with the uh, uh, ambassador the justin trudeau frankly uh, believes the global south to be uh, you know to be to, to, to that they should be subordinate basically to the to through the de- so called developed countries to the global north that is his view and in practice what he says in words is absolutely you know uh, of no consequence it's practice that you judge a man by and look at the way he came to india putting on the dress or or you know or, or, or our own dress oh this is the way to charm the natives you put on their own dress maybe you hand out trinkets and beads to them and they'll be charmed no justin trudeau no. the fact is we are among the four great powers india russia china and the united states yes and so when so the us ambassador treats us as so, so this is exactly the, the issue American so professor alapa this is this is it is time to protest this is exactly the issue let me get ambassador mukherjee ambassador mukherjee what you are reasonably as a just an as an educated human being you are expecting the americans to come and tell you that look we have messed about in every country and everybody knows we carry out these extra judicial killings all the time we do them we we don't make bones about it we are boasting about them our president says yes we went today and we docked off uh, osama bin laden and what a great op- op- operation well done guys we know we do it there is no reason for india to even aspire to do such a thing because if there are trouble makers your enemies are our enemies and if they happen to be on our territory we'll be happy in fact take all measures to catch them instead we will fund them shield them provide them with all sorts of refuge and then say we are our friends how, how does that make sense to any reasonable person in the first instance my question rishab would be to the american ambassador that has he come here to improve and strengthen the india us strategic partnership or sh- has he by mistake come here and should the americans have instead have sent him to the people's republic of china because he does not seem to be functioning as an american ambassador to india to further the bilateral relationship he is actually damaging the bilateral relationship by talking nonsense about india crossing thin red line when everybody knows who has crossed all the time not thin but rather thick black red pink purple lines whatever you would like to call them but my question is much more fundamental which is that the us ambassador by doing so he is actually interfering in india's internal affairs because we are in the middle of an election campaign he is trying to voice 
words which have been written about in journals hostile to india outside and which are being cited in a in a in a in a in a manner which is extremely unfortunate by some parties belonging to the opposition yeah. so he is getting involved in internal no there, no there is a problem and we can and we should take great umbrage i've just come great umbrage to this to this no i'm just i was just having this conversation there's a political party that is currently organized today a global protest and where is the protest taking place in brampton in vancouver what's going on so then general duvedi my obvious next question is why aren't we giving it back why is the minister of external affairs not decrying the absolute farce that is going on i grew up in when i was in school uh being told that a us president uh, has just admitted to having oral sex uh, in the oval office uh, his wife stayed on with him and i'm glad they figured it out and they moved on in life but today a sitting us or former us president is facing criminal conviction he is the principal opposition leader what's happening to the opposition in the us why aren't we worried about democracy in the us absolutely this is i think we need to decry loud and clear and in that first of all most we must bring it out that india draws its own lines india decide the color of your lines india decide the thickness of the own lines we do not go by the lines drawn by others first and foremost secondly india has its own copy book of democratic system we do not borrow others copy books and we run the country the way we like and in that every indian has a role to play second point and thirdly we need to give a snub and a very very clear snub a snub which hurts the ambassador of america and also the american you know the government that india will not accept this type of double standards we are very credible country we do not interfere in anyone but we will not accept any interference from the others i think your point is well made we need to make a very clear diplomatically and also by other means that such a thing is not acceptable and no, will not it's, be accepted it's, 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 be responded very it's it's seriously. just bizarre okay so let at what point of time general sodi in a more ideal situation where we should be expected to be treated like adults in the room who are neither neither naive or blind or insane where we can actually sit down and say listen it is highly inappropriate for individuals and organizations that are actively seeking the disintegration of the indian state to be funded operated and potentially shielded by a north american establishment five eyes or no eyes rishab i think india has been doing a phenomenal job by bringing out in various international forums and bilateral meets about this point where india has put on false allegations one great example is last year when the nsa of america visited india our nsa told him very clearly that gur patwan singh pannu is a cia agent i don't think in in a previous history has any senior indian government officer told the american so bluntly such things so india is doing the right step we are uh, we are not as vocal as the americans because we have our own sabhyata sanskriti sanskar where we are taught and we follow to the hilt that friendship is to be kept in a decent and a dignified manner yes. and wherever certain points have to be brought out we do it uh, in in little secrecy not in the public domain but yes we are doing it okay ladies and gentlemen it's it's as simple you know and i say it to every foreigner that i meet India is not a death to America country. We have a country that really hold, holds North America in awe. I mean, tens of thousands of us want to go study there, and they want to work there, and they contribute so much to the American economy. That that story has been told so many times. So we expect to be treated like adults. Listen, guys, we've been meddling in every country in the world, including yours. All right. Uh, we can't officially accept it but yeah uh, jalliya wala bag uh, somebody should have really apologized uh, maybe king charles should uh, maybe they should return the kohinoor maybe the germans should stop telling the africans on what to do with their elephants uh, i was just thinking of putting a photograph of all the viceroys with their hunting trophies of all the tigers in india and then put a photograph of them now preaching conservation of elephants in africa it's it's a joke it's laughable the hypocrisy is smacking you in the face and if you think we're just going to swallow it and turn the other cheek well that is come on as you know there's an aphorism fool me once 
shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, or as George Bush would say, say it, you can't fool me again. Jesus Christ. Take a break. Thank you. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.